It's Friday, December 6th, and this is the Daily Medical News, where we bring you clinical medicine's top stories, plus a closer look at the day's biggest news. I'm Mary Ellen Schneider. And I'm Molly Collegio. Today, victims of gunshot wounds face a high risk of hospital readmission. Children with type 1 diabetes have a new treatment option. The FDA has approved an in-office option for treating recurrent ear infections. And individuals with autism spectrum disorder face risks for anxiety and depression. Plus, a new migraine treatment has produced promising results in a phase three trial. Could an FDA approval be next? And now, the news. Don't think of a gunshot wound as a one-time event. Victims of this type of trauma face years, if not decades, of increased risk for re-hospitalization. That was the finding from a single institution retrospective analysis that looked at three months of inpatient imaging exams that were non-acute but related to gunshot wounds. Researchers then looked back at the original gunshot wound imaging. In all, they reviewed 174 imaging studies involving 110 patients. Overall, they found that having a gunshot wound made patients more likely to face hospital readmission. But types of wounds mattered. Patients who sustained visceral gunshot wounds were over six times more likely to be readmitted to the hospital. Also, patients who were initially admitted to the intensive care unit, likely because they had more severe injuries, were also more likely to be readmitted. Dr. Corbin Pomerantz is a radiology resident at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. He led the study. He said the readmission risk could be driven in part by gaps in care following the initial injury. For instance, a patient with a spinal cord injury may not be reimbursed adequately for supportive cushioning or an appropriate wheelchair. That could lead to additional medical problems down the line, such as lower extremity wounds. Dr. Pomerantz presented the findings at the annual meeting of the Radiological Society of North America. Children with type 1 diabetes now have a new treatment option. The Food and Drug Administration has expanded the indication for Tujeo, a 300 units per milliliter insulin glargine injection, to include children as young as age 6. The FDA first approved Tujeo in 2015 with indications for adults with type 1 or type 2 diabetes. But new evidence from the Addition Junior trial found that Tujeo had non-inferior reduction in hemoglobin A1c in children and adolescents when compared with insulin glargine at 100 units per milliliter. Earlier this year, the European Medicines Agency Committee for Medicinal Products for Human Use recommended approval of Tujeo in children with diabetes. The FDA also approved a new option for treating recurrent pediatric ear infections. The Tubes Under Local Anesthesia, or TULA system, is the first system that allows physicians to insert ear tubes in the office setting using only local anesthesia. Previously, children had to undergo general anesthesia at the hospital. Dr. Jeff Shuren is the director of the agency's Center for Devices and Radiological Health, He hailed the approval as a way to offer expanded patient access to treatment. The system should not be used in children with allergies to some local anesthetics or in children younger than six months. It is also not intended for children with pre-existing eardrum issues, such as perforated eardrums. We'll be back after this message with more medical news. Individuals with autism spectrum disorder could be at significantly higher risk for bipolar disorder, anxiety, and depression. Those are the findings from a population-based cohort study involving more than 1,000 individuals with ASD and more than 2,000 sex-matched controls without ASD. 
Overall, the individuals with ASD were over nine times more likely to be diagnosed with bipolar disorder, nearly three times more likely to be diagnosed with depression, and over three times more likely to be diagnosed with anxiety. Dr. Alexandra Kirsch is with the Department of Psychiatry and Psychology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. She led the study. She suggested that having ASD can mean having significant difficulties developing and maintaining relationships, challenges succeeding academically, and hard-to-manage behaviors. These all increase the risk for mood and anxiety symptoms. Dr. Kirsch called for early and ongoing surveillance and targeted treatments to address the psychiatric needs of individuals with ASD. The findings appear in JAMA Pediatrics. A new migraine treatment could be headed for FDA approval on the strength of positive results in a Phase three study. In the ACHIEVE-1 trial, about 20% of patients with an acute migraine who received ubrogapant were pain-free two hours later. That's compared with 12% of patients on placebo. Also, about 38% of patients who received the investigational drug said they were free of their most bothersome migraine-related symptom, such as photophobia or nausea, at two hours. That's compared with 28% of patients on placebo. These findings were reported in the New England Journal of Medicine. Ubrogapant is an oral calcitonin gene-related peptide receptor antagonist. Its developer, Allergan, currently has an application pending before the FDA, and a decision is expected in December. Dr. Alan Rappaport suspects the agency will approve the drug following the submission of appropriate safety data. Dr. Rappaport is a clinical professor of neurology at the University of Los Angeles and editor-in-chief of Neurology Reviews. He added that many more patients need to take this drug before we can be sure it is safe and effective. If approved, Ubrogapant would join other treatments targeting CGRP. There are currently three, and soon to be four, injectable monoclonal antibodies against CGRP functionality, according to Dr. Rappaport. These are preventive, not acute care drugs. And that's it for today's Daily Medical News. Be sure to catch the newest episodes of CardioCast and the Post Call Podcast, available today and every Friday. For MD Edge, I'm Mary Ellen Schneider. Our stories this week were contributed by Doug Brunk, Steve Stiles, Lucas Frankie, Richard Frankie, Bruce Jansen, Alexander Otto, Christopher Palmer, Jake Ramali, Heidi Spleet, Michelle Sullivan, Gregory Twachtman, Tara Haley, Bianca Nograti, Will Pass, Eric Greb, Richard Kirkner, Carrie Oaks, Megan Brooks, and Mitchell Zoller. Our editors include Terry Rudd, Mary Ellen Schneider, Therese Borden, Katie Lennon, Glenn Williams, Catherine Nellist, Jeff Evans, Elizabeth Meshkati, Susan Jeffrey, Laura McGlade, Mark Lesney, Gina Henderson, Catherine Hackett, and Renee Matthews. Our news team is led by executive editors Denise Fulton and Kathy Scarbeck. And I'm Molly Collegio. If you like what you hear on the Daily Medical News, please leave us a review or rating on Apple Podcasts. And check out the full stories available via the links in the podcast notes. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next week.